welcome to the Kicks EAP podcast, your monthly podcast with important leaders in education from Eastern Europe, Middle East and North Africa, Central Asia, and the Asia Pacific. I'm your host, Ryan Allen, assistant professor at Chapman University here in Southern California, and my own background is in international and comparative education. Let's start the show. Well, we have a wonderful guest today. Amanith Shafia Adam, assistant professor at the Maldives National University, and we go through her educational background, her teaching and research experience, and then also the impact that she's having on the Maldives and some of the barriers that this island nation faces. It's a wonderful interview, and she's just such a positive person. I think everyone is going to really enjoy this, so let's jump to it. All right, Shafia, thanks for joining us today. If we could jump into your educational background. Uh, I see that you you did a bachelor's degree in, in Egypt and then a, a master's degree uh, in Malaysia, and then you did your doctoral work in uh, New Zealand. So can you maybe kind of talk about your, your journey? And it's such a, it's such a globe-trotting experience, I think. It's very true, Alan, actually. Um, I, when I recall back how I actually started my education, it was very, very interesting. Like I had my um, education at the early stage in Arabic medium, which I had my school in uh, up until secondary. I completed an Arabic, Arabic school. And then I got the government scholarship to, um, to study in, in Egypt. And that's, that's normally given when um, high achievers, uh, for high achievers. So I was very fortunate to have the government scholarship. And then um, what I studied was um, uh, teaching. So I, I became a teacher. I had my Bachelor of Education there. But uh, uh, believe me, but it was such a great experience because I finished my school at the very, very young age because normally the Arabic system um, they also finish about 18 years at the uh, end of the secondary school, but I completed my school at 17 mm. because I was one year, one year younger. And then I remember actually uh, celebrating my first birth, uh, 17th birthday in Egypt. I was very, very young, going to a hostel, living there, seeing new people, especially someone who's coming from a very small country where like um, we have never seen what, um, what people are living outside our country. So it was kind of really interesting. I had such a great experience in Egypt for about nine years. And I, I completed my degree. I got married. I got my first baby. And then I completed my postgraduate study. And then... Yeah, that was a kind of like I lived my life there. I mean, basically, I started my life there. Um, and then I came back in 2000 to the Maldives and I became, um, I mean, initially, I was just a teaching assistant before my first degree. And then when I came, became, became, when, I, like, when I returned back, I got the opportunity to work as a teacher educator because I already had my postgraduate and some experience um, there. So um, yeah, from there, I started my journey as a teacher educator, it was 2000. Yeah, then what happened was after that, um, normally in the Maldives, it is, um, it is I, I, how would I say that English is the um, common medium of instruction, not Arabic. So I decided to study English because um, um, at my institution, it was more acceptable than Arabic medium and more courses are offered in English medium than in Arabic or in local language. So I had to kind of like switch my mindset to really study English and do my further studies um, in English. So I actually took a challenge and perhaps it was a risk too because I had to actually change my whole education um, medium and reading and all that from Arabic to English. Yeah, it was a very, very big challenge. Then I decided to do my master's in English and I went to uh, Malaysia. I was just my self-finance, um, not, not given a government uh, scholarship. Then yeah, from there, then 
which was kind of interesting. I studied English and then I completed my master's um, and then did my research. Um, that was my second research, actually. I started uh, doing research um, when I was in Egypt with my supervisors. But um, I remember even when I was studying in Malaysia and some of my courses, I even mentioned that I would do my PhD definitely in two or three years time of my master's completion. And interestingly, I have even mentioned I would do it in New Zealand. <laughs> I don't know why it was years back. I mean, I did never even think then why I was actually selective now thinking about New Zealand. I did not meet anyone actually from New Zealand then. But I remember that um, just having some modules and there was some expectations. What would you do your for future studies? So a lot, yeah. Coming back all together, like starting from um, an Arabic community mm -hmm. and going to South Asian and then going to kind of European system, which was kind of a, a huge difference in terms right. of the culture, in terms of the people, how they live, and then what things that you actually get as a person living overseas in all right. these countries. And I remember when I was in Egypt, Egypt is kind of a very open community, mm. especially because I was living in Cairo. Cairo city is a big city with multicultural, different, different countries. So yes, it was very, very interesting. Though I am a Muslim um, 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 girl there living in a hostel, I had so many friends, Christian friends. So I had the opportunity to mingle with different, different um, kind of um, people. And I enjoyed because the hostel where I lived, um, there were about 30 countries, girls living from 30 countries. So we had all different sort of girl stuff, like uh, more when having uh, events and dance and all that. Really enjoyed my time when I was living in a hostel. So that was my first, uh, first sort of experience living with other cultures. Mm. And I am who I am now because of all these different um, cultural experiences, living with different uh, in different countries, also meeting a whole lot of different um, uh, people from different cultures as well. And when I was living in Malaysia, I Malaysia also kind of like they yes they are South Asian, but it's also a, you you kind you you will get to meet so many people from other cultures. So I was uh, studying in an international Islamic university then, and then where there were so many uh, different cultures as well. So yes, um, it was kind of a great. I think I had I am actually fortunate to have all these different experiences. Yeah. I haven't said anything about New Zealand yet. Sure, think, yeah. Yeah. New Zealand was the most um, precious time I had. Mm. If, I, I, if I recall um, how my experiences were like, I really appreciate the time that I was living in New Zealand. Actually, um, given me um, new, new, um, new way of learning, mm. new way of teaching, and, uh, and uh, give, I mean, I learned a lot by um, having the opportunities to see other schools because I was involved in many, many research projects, even when I was studying. So my supervisor was very, very um, generous with me, uh, unlike other students who she had. Um, because um, I remember some of her other students will always, always talk about like Amina gets more opportunities. She calls me Amina, by the way. So Amina gets more opportunities. Yes, I do a lot of work with her. And I had the opportunity to visit about 20 or 23 country, uh, schools in New Zealand. So part of different research projects. And that was very, very insightful for me because I have never seen schools like that in other countries. And, and though I had my, my practicum in Egypt in which I had to visit three schools, and then in Malaysia when I was doing my, my master's, I did research in two schools. But in New Zealand, I was kind of like some days when I see the schools, my, I can even hardly say, okay, sometimes my mouth was open, like so good schools compared to what I have seen. Mm -hmm. 
really quality teaching, really quality teachers, open-minded students who are having their a really good time and enjoying learning. This is something that it was really, you know, I even wrote a lot about this. I mean, my, some of my blogs that how, um, how much I have appreciated seeing those um, uh, beautiful moments of learning. And I love that. I always tell my students, learning should be something that you enjoy. And it is, it gives you really good uh, feel, feel that you are, you are happy to learn. And that right. thing we don't see in our country. Yeah, that's, yeah, I, I I love the story because it's, you know, you you even talked about yourself as like you were sort of this young girl uh, experiencing this new multiculturalism in, in Egypt with, with people from around the world. And then you sort of start to grow as a, as a scholar. And then when you, when you get to uh, New Zealand, you really start to, to become a, a true expert on on education and uh, a growth into a scholar, I can see that that's so that's uh, that's fantastic, and I can recognize some of the from my own experience too. I, I did a I did a degree in in South Korea, and I had just the type of experience of like going there and seeing people from around the world, and you know, just growing up in a way that I don't think I ever would have if if I was just in in my own country. So. Uh, the story and, and so many of us, we end up returning home uh, in, in some like cases. <laughs> right, right. So maybe can we can we talk about that? Uh, right now, you're an assistant professor uh, at Maldives National University. So can you kind of talk about uh, the university and maybe the, the program? Uh, what you know, who, who are your students? Who who are you passing this this experience to and, and sort of what, what are they hoping and what, what are they looking to go do? I always loved actually talking about um, learning because I, I talk to my students like learning is always something new. I, I tell you should appreciate every moment of learning because that is not something you can always catch. You have to catch it at the right time. So yes, um, why did I come back? That's a very big question. I mean, I, I was a resident in New Zealand I had the PR, so I was living there, and my son is still living there, by the way. He's working, and yeah, so he didn't come back with me. So yes, um, I was working in different research projects, and then I felt like my country needed me, and then so many people were asking why I am not coming back since I don't have any young children. I could just do a whole lot of work if I come back to the university where I was working earlier, I mean, um, I, I had about um, 10 years of experience in the same university before I went to my PhD. So I loved, actually, I loved the university and I really wanted to come back and do uh, some work, especially um, in relation to research, because I feel um, the Maldives really need people um, like us, especially those who can uh, contribute to the um, and return back what that what the country has given them, and this is something I even I was in, in New Zealand. I always talk and encourage people if you get the opportunity to go back, especially um, when you have when you don't have that much family responsibility, like your children have grown up and you are kind of sitting there and doing work for maybe, I don't want to say other countries, but for another community, which was not your origin. Yeah, but if your country needs you, I think you better be back. And, and I felt at some point, my country needed me. Mm -hmm. And then I also had another a big thing, which, um, which is not necessarily related to my profession. My husband is a general surgeon and he is a very popular general surgeon in the country. He was living in New Zealand just because of me. So many people in the health sector, they actually uh, write on the social media even like, uh, like why Dr. Obed is living in New Zealand and should be the time the country needs him. Mm -hmm. So I, and he didn't even have the um, a professional um, job in New Zealand. So that was another reason why I actually decided why both of us just there, we can still, we were young. I mean, we were just um, early 40s. Uh, I, don't know, I think I was late 30s, but my husband early 40s. So we 
thought this is the time we should be back and do some work. And yeah, I'm happy that I made that decision. And, and now my, my husband is, um, is the head of the Department of General Surgery. So yeah, the country really needed him as, mm. as well, not only me. So that's a collective decision. Like we decided together to come back. Sure. And then, yeah, my son, yeah, he's still living there. He's working in, in, in Wellington Hospital. So I'm very happy for him. So I did not have any family responsibility to um, have any excuse why I was living in another country. <laughs> when I came back, the big, big question, I, I promoted a different approach compared to what I had done earlier. This is something, I think it was a shift, I would rather say. A shift because um, early, earlier, when before my PhD, I could find so many things that I, um, I thought it was not really appropriate uh, teaching and learning methods used in our system. So I had seen in New Zealand and so many schools in the universities, um, the way of teaching and, and, and the student learning was very, very different from our country. I mean, I'm saying it very straightforward because we are uh, still complaining or maybe writing about how we are going to bring that change to our, our children thinking, our teachers thinking, and our professionals thinking as well. So I'm kind of having that, um, not necessarily because it is part of my job, but because I, I am really um, keen to bring a change to the country. So I write so many things on local newspapers. I, give, uh, I, I participate in so many panel discussions because I wanted to, I am really um, wanting to bring a change to the whole culture, mm. the learning culture, the professional teaching culture. Right. So some of the things that I still have in mind is, I might be one of the person who can really contribute to bring that change. And I talk a lot about those things because um, I feel that it is important to bring that conversation into um, uh, where you can bring uh, some sort of discussions around and really deliber deliberately people think about how to go about the change. Change is always struggling. I mean, change is not easy, especially when you have uh, things rooted in your culture. But I have said, even, even in my PhD thesis, um, there are certain things that we can call habitus. Do you know, like habitus? Yeah, habitus is you, things right? that you, yeah, you, you, you are embodied with certain things and it's really hard to crack that shell. That's kind of a thing. So cracking that shell, the nutshell, is kind of like um, covering everything and it gives little room to really open up. And some of those things, um, I actually um, um, brought this idea, we need to deliberately, intentionally think how we are gonna go about it. What do we need to do in terms of bringing that change? And we believe, and I think uh, in our, we, we, I mean, the Maldivians are lucky in terms of like, most of our professionals are studied overseas, especially the UK, the USA, New Zealand, Australia, so many uh, of our university, um, even uh, I, I would say 30% of the, you know, 30 or 40% of the university staff will be um, educated overseas. So those people have probably have seen all these changes, but when they come back, kind of people, I, I, I think I have even read in the, in the literature, people, when they return back to their uh, context of practice, they even um, become part of the logic of practice where it is established in the, in the, in the, in the, in the institutions. So that happens. But if someone really know or really won't bring a change, you have to go with your thinking rather than going with, with the, what do you call it? Um, you know that the place has a specific logic of practice, but if you think that that is not the right way, you should start thinking about what to do um, in order to bring a change. Yeah. Right. So yeah, I feel a lot of things need to um, uh, really rethink uh, not necessarily completely teen, it, uh, change, but reimagine and rethink. Mm. Yes, I would sure. rather use that one. Yeah. Sure. You know, I, I really appreciate your sort of talk about this idea of, you know, you, you go to the, the public media and you're sort of talking and, and bring your research uh, to a wider audience because so often in academia, 
you know, we publish it in a journal and other academics read it. And, you know, only a few people who specialize in something might read it. But if you're, if you're going on to newspapers and, and panel shows and, and things like that and, and talking on social media, the, the regular people will see it and, and understand it. And I think that's, that's just a fantastic way to, to approach our, our scholarship, to bring it out of the quote unquote ivory tower. I think. Yeah, I, I could share with you one example sure. of some of the things that I do. Um, I even um, call uh, TV channels, like I wanted to give this particular program, and just give me about five to seven minutes from your program so that I can talk about research and research, um, the, the how, to, how, to, how to make people thirst for knowledge and research or really um, establish that culture in the country. So some of those uh, programs that I have started actually working with other people um, in, in Raja TV channel, for example, I've mentioned in, and some uh, other channels like PSM, uh, that is uh, public service media. So all these channels, I personally, it's not part of my job because right. I really want, this is something that, uh, what I think uh, um, an obligation or what I call a responsibility because I'm a Maldivian. I also had the opportunity to live in other countries. I, I did have options uh, not to return and I don't necessarily need, need to come back and stay in the Maldives, but I came because I wanted to return back to return back something um, that I had um, in um, the experience or the insights that I have. I really wanted to share and then bring that to our culture. And some of those programs are um, related to how to do research. And there are very few people, this is something um, um, I think I would say um, very rare. Um, not many people who are educated, they give um, uh, so much um, knowledge or discussions in local language. Mostly they will speak in English and they will also uh, write in English and they will do all the things in English. But there are so many people who are not, um, who I would say, not, not obviously the local language, it would be the first, first, um, first language for them. It will be easier for people to really understand things. So I had this approach um, always, I say, if you know something, uh, even if you studied in English or in Arabic, if you really know what you have learned, you should be able to deliver it in your local language. And that is my motto. So if you're good at something, you should be able to talk about it in your local language because it's, it's something important. If you don't do that, your language is going to, it's not going to be there. It's just going, because especially countries like the Maldives, where the whole system is English medium. Our children, we are struggling actually to, to make our children love the local language. They don't love the local language. And something that I started working on it, um, even in my family, even with, with, with the student teachers that I talked, I always tell, please make sure your children when they're young, don't speak to them in English because you, you are really um, um, forgetting about our culture, forgetting about our language, they will need it. It's a heritage, it's a country heritage. You should not leave it like that. If you don't protect the language now, you are not going to do that later. Mm -hmm. it, it, it cannot be done when you when you think, okay, something is happening to our language and then you decided to do something and it can be fixed. No, it cannot be done like that. So you should be doing so many things along the way as you develop children or as you raise children, you have to really um, let focus them and give them opportunities to speak in local language as well. So some of my articles are related to how to make our children learn the language because our children, they don't speak in local language now. Mm. They don't speak, which is very sad. And I believe Part of intelligence is also having, having the ability to uh, be communicate in multilingual, if you are living in a multilingual context, having the ability to communicate with different languages adds something to your intelligence as well, because it helps you to think more, much broader than ra rather than thinking with one language. So I always tell the parents, do not restrict, don't, don't, don't think that if you let your children speak in Divahi, in the local language, it will um, influence or impact on and their improvement of English. No, I don't think so. 
and mm. literature has actually uh, shown us first language is the most important thing and then you can develop the second language and or parallelly you can do that so that is my thinking i write a lot about how um how to really um help children learn language though i am not a linguistic because i love my language right yeah that's i mean that's important uh, if you you're talking about culture and and heritage and you know that's not that's not something that you can you can just work out in in a book that's something that's part of the fabric of of society so yeah that's that's important um how about your students are they are they training to go to be teachers or what what kind of professions are are they going in to do yeah most of my my student teachers um i teach some of my courses are early childhood some in primary um a, a few in secondary teachers but because i work in the educational department which mm-hmm. uh, which which we call um all the core subjects related to teaching and pedagogy and all that are under our department so we call educational department at the faculty of education so most of the subjects that i teach are related to teaching teaching is like um um instructional psychology developmental psychology classroom management um uh, curriculum studies um teaching pedagogy and then um i see teen education and then yeah um sociology of education i teach all these subjects because i i started working even in 2000 i started uh, teaching many many subjects related to um teaching field the the education field so um even when i returned back i always say i i love to take some uh, courses from the um what do you call it for first year or second mm. year because that's where you can start in building some of the principles of teaching mold yeah. mold them there right yes so yes yeah, student teachers i love to have the first year batch one course and then maybe if i have if i have time i take in the masters course because normally i will have about two phd students so that, i mean i don't necessarily think that i should be just focusing on higher level because um i feel that Uh, the first year and the second year students will be also really important especially because i am a kind of a teacher love to have the conversational teaching not like a really lecture type because that's me and my students actually love my classes whether face to face or online and i because i enjoy teaching and it i not necessarily i'm a teacher by profession i remember when when i was very very young even when i was in the secondary school i always say i wanted to become a teacher i mean that, there was no other other thinking that who i am going to be even when i was young so teaching is like a part of me and then and teaching any year group is another interesting thing i feel even my my family would say like the younger children when they have interaction with me i will start teaching something and they will enjoy and that is something like um i don't know a give um, um a gift that i am lucky to have really um ha- easy for me to really conduct any teaching classes or carry out any activities that can make my students happy the most important thing is uh, to make um, my students happy i remember um, i love rita pearson by the way <laughs> do you know uh, she has given a very um, famous popular talk that Yeah, children can be champion if you make them feel champions, <laughs> right? And so I I I have that motto always. I I tell my students you should actually think always positive about your your students because you can make them champion if you think they are mm. champion if you can make them feel champion. So it is about the students. So I teach my student teachers to take that motto in their mind. You are not teaching because you are good at teaching. you are teaching because you feel that you st- you st- your students are worth to become champions so right. that motto it's it's a, so beautifully you can translate into your practice it's about loving the field it's about loving the children it's about loving the way that you teach and then mm-hmm. live the moment and enjoy it live the right. moment of your teaching not because you are given a salary not because you have so um okay flexible hours to teach regardless you just love the teaching because it is your passion it is your 
question. So, yeah, um, I think I love teaching. I enjoy I, teaching. I can, Something I can, that I can't separate it from me. Yeah. I can, I can tell. And I think our listeners are, are going to be able to tell too. And, and they're probably wishing they could, you know, sit in one of your classes or, or see you teach uh, one of these days. I guess with, with Zoom technology, maybe, uh, maybe. Yes. One of but um, I guess that uh, kind of goes into my next question. You know, I, I couldn't help when, I'm, when I was preparing for the interview, just kind of looking at the, the geography of, of the Maldives and sort of the location of the university and, and the rest of the island chain. And it's just, it, it occurred to me that uh, it, it, there must be challenges and barriers to this, the, to the way that the, the, the nation is sort of set up. Um, but, but you yourself also use technology in education, you, you research, you study that. So I'm kind of wondering how, uh, how you've overcome that challenge or attempt to sort of o- overcome that challenge or work within the parameters of, of, of sort of yes. the, the geography. Alan, you've actually addressed a very important point here. Um, one of the things that I noticed, yes, even in some of my publication, I've highlighted there are so many challenges mm. and limitations, barriers in terms of um, our geographical situation, geographical context. But um, what I would say, um, we have grown, I mean, um, compared to our early education system. I remember when I was working in the, at the university before my PhD, we had only, um, I, I don't think we had um, um, online modes per se, teaching online modes. But um, when I returned back in 20, late 2018, I found so many courses that started online and some blog modes. And then, yes, um, which actually given the opportunity for students who were living in other islands no. to really study in universities. Um, we have only two universities. Both of them are in the Mali city, I mean, the capital city, which is very sad. We don't have other universities in, in islands, but they started um, uh, um, having the outreach camp, uh, centers and campuses in other big cities. But this, I mean, what, what I'm saying is, yeah, the university even itself has grown and, and broadened their courses to um, offer online and virtual modes. Um, but we did have very, um, I mean, we did have many challenges. I think it's because of the infrastructure. We, uh, we are sort of um, good and when compared to other countries in, in, in the region, I mean, the Asian countries where we are living in the neighboring countries. But still, I feel the internet, we have, um, the, the speed is very low and we, um, we find it uh, really difficult to communicate um, um, smoothly and seamlessly when we use the internet. So, but what I see now is very, very different from um, even last two years, which I would say, uh, I think our student, um, had to change. That's something right. that I felt. Had to change means like uh, there were no other options except using the internet. Mm-hmm. There were no other options except using the internet for learning, for communication, for other life purposes because of the COVID, I think. Right. And I'm doing a research now about um about remote teaching and student learning experiences uh, due to the COVID pandemic. And I found some of these things are really talking aloud. What had actually changed throughout just two years time because there was no other option. Right. That is the only thing. People right. had to change they were, they were, because people were locked down that there were no other option. They can go to the university. They can go to other places. Everybody, every, every, all the places were locked and they will stay home and they will be using the internet. Students have become so familiar with the digital technologies. I'm not talking about only the young children, but also the higher education students and the young children, all of them. They have become so familiar with the use of technologies as, as we say normally, okay, I think I did probably have mentioned change is always um, difficult, but uh, when there are no options, when you don't have any other options, you don't think about, uh, because there are no alternatives, right? 
right. and then well, yeah if there are no alternatives you will use it and then when you use it you forget whether it was difficult or um, or easy rather mm. you just use it and then habits start to develop now i think our teachers even i in some of my findings actually have have shown already they don't even and even think that it was difficult hello just before 2 or 2 years you were thinking it's very very difficult to teach online i mean now they are saying um and some of my questions were how how confident were you before the pandemic and how confident are you after the pandemic so there were a specific tools given and how they become familiar and interestingly they did not know anything about such tools and they become so confident in using those tools because of the pandemic right. so what i say sometimes you should not think that um okay yeah we all are really we are very very sad because of the really the the terrible time we are having our children and all that but there are so many good things and yesterday i think i published an article about this and what i said a teachers had the teachers got I, I, this is what i said teachers got the opportunity to shine because of the covid mm. <laughs> covid 19 because they have done so much work to manage and mitigate the challenges that they had because of the school closure and teachers right. learn to use technologies they learn to engage students they learn to make uh, um, the home setting a comfortable place and uh, talking to parents and really bring them to the page to uh, manage the learning situations for the children these are things that we have never seen the schools they had only about parents meeting earlier now it is ongoing everyday conversation you know this is the thing that we want we want the parents and teachers to be together in order to provide better learning for our children now this is happening why because we did not have any alternatives so yeah, yeah. And now i feel like our teachers are champions i call them champions some of my facebook posts i said even i feel like my teachers are champions and my student teachers are so motivated and really passionate about bringing a change and make a children really learn even during their online practicum i i have observed how they were um, really um passionately bringing changes really not necessarily uh, they they had because uh, most teacher education programs they did not have this kind of a uh, um, topic area how to manage teaching during crisis time right there were no topics like that but because uh, student teachers uh, had to complete their practicum online some of those things uh, they have if they because the, the university has given the student teachers the option to do online if it was not the final practicum mostly they have three practicum so the final practicum we will still feel that they will need to do in a school setting because that is part of the big pro, uh, big part of what they will do in schools right so they cannot they cannot graduate unless they have the uh, school setting uh, practicum yes they can do if there is first practicum and the second practicum uh, online but what i have seen is because um in my class especially my early childhood group which i had a very beautiful bunch of uh, students who were so passionate about teaching and young children and then they were sharing some of their teaching experiences i was actually enjoying my time with them because they said uh, they call me miss so they they say our uh, miss actually we actually dance in our class like in or in front of the screen and the children will dance and i call, i i tell the children bring all all the family members also let them dance with you so that is kind of in a environment even in a physical setting class they would do that right but online also they can do that and they ask the children go outside explore the tree bring two three leaves and let's uh, let's do some experiments how is it the leaf printing is happening how, how does it look like so so many practical activities teachers started learning about new ways to bring into the classrooms on online class mm. these are new ideas and i am writing about these things because these are beautiful ideas for teaching and 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 i appreciate the time uh, even though it's a hard hard time during the covid uh, pandemic for everybody but you can make it beautiful you can make it beautiful 
So don't think it's always about the hiccups. No, there are some beautiful moments. Uh, yeah, I, outlayed, yes. I, I love your your positivity. Uh, it's just, it, it's infectious, I think. And uh, I'm sure your students, I mean, I, you know, I can tell your students probably uh, have that, you know, from you and build off of that. So that that's great. As somebody who's looked at some of the the things in COVID with uh, with sort of a half uh, a half glass empty it myself and yes. it, hear, hearing your you know your silver lining and talking about the positivity you know that makes myself feel good hopefully the the viewers with listening to this at home uh they're thinking that as well so that's we, we, Ellen, actually this is something very new for the molders because our teachers are not familiar with technology that much mm, before the covid right. before the covid 19 uh, so um but now they don't they don't feel hesitant to talk about it anymore. They're not reluctant to share their experiences, how they use technologies. And I have, I had already seen that. And I asked a student teachers in my new courses. So what do you feel about the use of technology in your teaching? So now they talk so freely without um, having that hesitance that whether I'm doing right or wrong, because that thing is there earlier. Yeah, I, I can see the change. I can see the change happening. Yeah. Mm. That's, that's fantastic. We're kind of coming to the end of the interview. Uh, just maybe one final question. Uh, we talked about, you know, the students, we talked, we even heard a little bit about, uh, you know, media and this type of thing. And maybe it mentioned something about parents, but how about the government? Have you, have you had any, uh, any luck with sort of the government and, and the ear of, of officials or, or different programs or anything uh, like that? So I am working with the Ministry of Education uh, in about two or three projects um, related to uh, parental involvement in education one. Another one is um, school improvement program, which is um, led by my, uh, yeah, myself. And then and those projects are very much related to um, school research and stuff, especially for those schools in some regions where the student learning is identified um, as something that we need to address and support. So, um, so um, um, through the research, we are kind of uh, trying to provide uh, additional um, input for helping our, our, those teachers to improve their student learning because those schools are identified as low in their mm -hmm. grades. Um, so I am part of that project and I am leading with a team and I wrote that project and we received uh, World Bank funding for that. And that is um, um, going to be across uh, 12 atolls and about 119 schools. Wow. And yeah, and the communities where these schools are, uh, some of those uh, communities are very small communities in islands and uh, and I'm also um, leading some projects for the higher education, particularly teacher education institutions. Mm -hmm. We have about um, four teacher education institutions and out of them, two universities and others were colleges. So I am working with uh, many um, teacher education institutions, particularly improving their teacher education programs, um, especially for those um, uh, projects um, where we found um, a lot of programs which are offered in local language, they did not have um, enough um, uh, books for, for those programs written in local language. And it's not really, um, because for those who are uh, doing the programs in English medium, obviously there are many books, but for the local language medium programs, they did not have any difference. So I had actually written a proposal uh, to uh, uh, really publish those books and we received funding as well from overseas. So um, yeah, it's about uh, for me now at this moment, I think for, for the time being, a lot of my work is involved in writing proposals to different uh, grant um, uh, for, for seeking funding and, start, and from overseas and local. And so uh, every single day, mostly I am kind of involved in writing proposals. I right. do a lot of those kind of things and I have about 15 research projects involved in even wow. at the moment, apart from my teaching. And I'm also um, uh, helping many uh, teacher education institutions to come together, do some collaborative work because I believe uh, you can't possibly think as an individual, it's a collective thing if you're gonna 
if you're going to do something good for your country, like that is, uh, okay, that institution works separately and the other institution works separately. It doesn't work that way. You have to work, if, you, if you're going to improve something in schools, you have to work together because we want all our graduates to be really good. It's not a competition. It's not competition. Okay, the, the more national u- university graduates are going to be the best students. No, you have to make all student teachers are good. And right. then you can bring a change to the country. So my thing is, it's not about only my institution. It's about my country. It's, it's not one institution. It's about my country. I am doing what I'm doing because I'm doing it for my country. Right. And I have no other intention out of it. And I always tell that I don't work for the salary. And, and no, I'm not interested because of the higher salary or any other. Because I'm, uh, but we, but we thank God that I am living like, um, like a, I don't say young mom, but I, I have time to give now. I have, um, um, okay, I have experience to share. And this is the time where that I feel do, do big things. It's not just go with single institution or single group then, rather the big, big ideas that you can bring to the country. So my message for, for all the people who are like teacher educators, I always say, let's do things together. Let's do collaborative work. So I invite people to be part of my research projects. And I'm doing a lot of uh, many research projects with other universities as well, because I feel that it's one, one space that you're working together because your aim is one. Your aim is improving education in the country. That you can't do it if you are just focusing on one institution. Yeah, that's one. Just from this interview, you, you, you have sort of, you're working across the society and all the different sectors from the, the people and the, sort of the, the, the regular people and across the islands. Uh, to to the government, so it's just great to hear, and I, I I really love your attitude about about the whole you know way of teaching. It's just positive and inspiring. So, Shivya, thanks for uh, joining us on, on the podcast. We really appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. And I would like to add something. I always sure. tell people you have to you have to take initiatives. Mm-hmm. Don't wait for someone to tell you what to do. You know what you need. You have you have a target to reach then you take the initiative. Don't ask uh, whether it's okay or not. You go for it. Check how it's going to work for you with your, with your main target. Yeah, I am trying to establish a research culture in a good school, good school learning, what I say, good teachers, and that is my aim for our country. I always say my country, yeah. Well, there's no doubt you know, from, from talking to you that, that you're, gonna, you're gonna get that goal. So uh, we'll look forward to, to follow your career and. and- maybe uh, back in the future. So thank you. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you very much, Alan. And this concludes our Kix EAP podcast, which is released every first Wednesday of the month. Of course, the opinions expressed on the Kix EAP podcast are solely those of the host and the guest. The Kix EAP podcast is made possible by Kix, which stands for Knowledge and Innovation Exchange. KICS is an initiative of the Global Partnership for Education. Globally, KICS is administered by the International Development Research Center in Canada. NORAG in Geneva hosts one of the four regional hubs of KICS. Thanks for listening. Find us on the NORAG or GPE KICS websites. You can subscribe to the KICS EAP podcast, newsletter, and webinar series, and also learn about KICS global or regional projects. Additionally, you can subscribe directly on Spotify or SoundCloud to receive notifications of the new monthly podcast episodes.